I could still tell it was still my car. Well, my blue with white stripes 1997 Dodge Viper is my favorite car. It's the one I've had the longest, I've got the most adventures and memories with, and the one that I will most likely keep forever. That was also my first story on Ben Wiki. It was the first one of mine that was well over a million and really got recognizable for that and has been a mainstay on my channel and I keep having adventures. And in that story, I talked about how that was my first wild exotic car when I lived in the small town of Tiffin, Ohio, and basically the thing that got me kicked out of town because I enjoyed it exuberantly on a daily basis on the roads surrounding the town. The general populace and some law enforcement didn't take as kindly to that, and I thought maybe I should go somewhere where my personality and this car will vibe a little bit better. The part of the story that really got glossed over a good bit was the car got wrecked. And it was to no fault of my own, but when I lived down in Columbus, Ohio, and I was in Dublin, it was a warm December day. There was, it was a dry road, everything was fine. I was just coming back from a Cars and Coffee and driving very normally and very legally. And someone tried to blaze across five lanes of traffic where you were only legally allowed to turn right. Uh, I couldn't avoid them, hit it, the car was totaled. Uh, just with everything going on in my life in the time, I really didn't have time to fix it. And insurance took it, and I didn't think that much of it. I was sad, uh, but I had the car for a while. I thought it's time for a new adventure, get something fresher. It's somewhat funny because I bought a C6 Corvette with a smaller portion of the money that I got from insurance, and I thought this is gonna be a little bit more everydayable. I can take the top off, it's a little bit more comfortable, the air conditioning works better, the stereo sounds a little better, it's gonna be great. And I thought it was good fun for a while, and I went out and bought a Ducati motorcycle that I had always wanted, the Mike Hale with MH900D, and I felt pretty good. And the Corvette was going fine, but it's kind of like you have a moment in life, and I had it with this car on an on-ramp that I always enjoyed so much in the Dodge Viper because I'd hit first gear, second gear, and it would sound so amazing in the Dodge Viper, and I'd be just spinning the tires all the way up to like 70 miles an hour, and the exhaust would echo off the walls and the, the, the barriers, and it was awesome. And I went to go do it in the Corvette. And it was the biggest letdown ever, and that was the moment that I realized that Corvette for me was the quintessential rebound relationship. <laughs> this isn't the long term, this isn't gonna work, and it totally killed the Corvette for me because it would never be my Dodge Viper. And it was something like a year that had gone by, and after the car got wrecked, there were a number of parts the insurance company didn't care about that I just kept. I think I had like a subwoofer and some stereo stuff, maybe the wing off the car, and just a number of odds and ends. I had a personal steering wheel or Fittipaldi steering wheel, things like this that I, I just kept for the car and they laid around. I don't, I don't know what I kept them for. Maybe I was gonna sell them. Maybe I thought I was gonna buy a Viper in the future and being a pack rat, but I had them. And I still remember vividly, I got a phone call from a number I didn't recognize, but what happened was over the course of the last year, year and a half, the car went to auction, insurance auction. A guy up in Michigan bought it and he was starting to put it back together. Straighten the frame rails, fix the hood, put it all together. And my car still had a Putsch Racing sticker on it. And he saw that, started tracking it down, figured out it was my car, somehow find my number and called me. And he goes, I'm, I'm rebuilding this car. And I'm like, yeah, that's my old car. He goes, is there any chance you have any parts for it? And I'm like, yeah, actually I do. Which was hilarious, or maybe funnier later in the story, because he ended up buying parts off of me that I had. I might even had like floor mats and stuff. I didn't think anything up. So I sold these parts of the, the car to this guy and he was building it, stayed in touch a little bit, but I didn't think anything of it. It wasn't, not my car, it was gone. Maybe six months later, he calls me up again. He goes, well, I got it done and I was enjoying it, but I think I'm gonna sell it. Do you have any interest in it? I'm like, maybe. But I, I moved on, like I, I'm, I'm trying to tell myself, like that chapter's come and gone. But I'm gonna go look at the car. So I go up into Michigan and it was pretty much like right in the winter. It was rather cold and checked out the car. I sort of made a deal on the car. Like the guy sent me pictures and I was no longer emotionally attached. It was like the relationship that went away. It's like, we're not getting back together. Nope, nope, I'm over you. I don't need this. You know, one of those kind of things. And so I, I really lowballed the guy. I remember going up there, I think briefly with my dad to check it out. Like we had a little bit of time. We just went to take a peek at the car. And I looked at it and the way that it was repaired was, it was like, okay, but it wasn't nice. 
It was the way you would if you wanted to get a car done quickly and make a good car that was drivable, but you weren't trying to make it overly perfect, but you also get excited and want to throw a bunch of money at even more ridiculous parts for it. So the car had way overly harsh, ridiculous low, low ring springs on it. It had later all black Viper wheels on it that were larger with thinner profile tires and invented uh, brake rotors and such. So it just, it, it drove like a car with no shocks on Michigan roads. It was kind of horrible in that way. and felt like it was going to fall apart because of it. Also, the old wing was gone and the guy put on the Hennessy wing, which looks like a Toyota Supra, which is a rare part. You can't get them anymore. And it's kind of cool looking back from 90s nostalgia, but when I saw it on my car, I'm like, this, this looks kind of dumb. And it no longer had the cool Daytona nose with the splitter because that got destroyed in the wreck. So I had a stock nose. And it was still my car, but it didn't feel right. And he also got rid of the stock black seats and put in what were kind of cool. They were one company made or redid Viper seats with blue leather and a white stripe, which to me is kind of what the baby boomer generation likes to do when they get really excited about a hot rod. They want to paint the whole interior to match the exterior color of a car. And they may love that, but I really don't at all. So that's the way my Viper was. It even had a blue shift knob with the white stripes. Like you took the white stripes thing way too far. I test drive the car and I, I did it on my own. My dad stayed there and that was a, a bit of a moment because I could still tell it was still my car. And it was kind of like if you've ever been in a relationship and then you kind of came back and had a little fun. It's like, whoa, we just had laughs. I remember why I fell in love with this car or person in the first place. It's like, but this isn't the same thing, you know? And I brought it back and I was, I was interested in it, but I was kind of divorced. It also had like ridiculous tinted windows and it was, it had tinted tail lights, so they don't work, you know? And all of these things going on, but you could hear a distinct tick in the engine, which was not a little tick. And I'm listening to this, I'm like, this is valve train, but this is also gonna take a lot of hours and a little bit of money. And I'm, I'm not, this isn't a little thing. And that tick wasn't there when I had it. So I'm thinking, what, what happened to this poor thing in the meantime? But it was, drove well, it was, it was relatively straight and everything was fixed pretty well. The paint match was okay and all. So I, I drove away and as my dad was, because he just hates all projects, or I don't know if he goes into the dad thing, thinking that even though I can build a car from nothing, I'm still his son. And I think he thinks I'm still an eight year old kid and he's gonna have to do the work for me. But he's like, no, terrible car. And I was sleeping on it, and I think there was there was something else I was gonna buy, and I was gonna be try to be more reasonable. But my wife, who I think was my fiance at the time, she said to me, that car's your baby. That car's you. That's the one you need to buy. And I was like, nah, I'm gonna be reasonable. And I called the guy, which is kind of nice because you're divorced from it, and I was able to more lowball him. My Viper gets wrecked. It was pretty cherry, and then it was gone for a few years, and I got, I think like $43,000 from the insurance company. And then a few years later, I bought back my same car running and driving, but configured differently with all these parts for like $25,000. So even though I got to fix engine things, I've, I've got a lot of room to work with. I mean, I got so much room to work with, I don't care at this point. So I got it back and I was happy. It felt good, but the car needed love. It had all kinds of issues. It wasn't right. It was, it, it, your, your fillings would fall out of your teeth. It had the worst suspension in the world on over any bumps. So I'm gonna start working on it. And at that time, I was getting into the first year of Genius Garage. So I was spending so much time with that and putting my own resources into it. I wasn't making any money. Like, it was rough. The car went back home to my condo. Like so many young people, I'm renting a condo in this little two car garage. And that's where the Omega car sat for many years before I decided to work on it again and drive it. But I narrowed it down. I took the valve covers off and I started looking down at those lifters. And with the Viper engine being a big pushrod V10, much like if anybody's working on a small block Ford or Chevy, you can take the valve covers off, you can take the rockers, you can pull out the push rods. except the Dodge Viper has one really stupid feature stuck. Unlike a small block, Chevy or Ford. The head gaskets have so much extra material that they cover the holes where the lifters are. So it's impossible to just take the lifters out from the valley with the stock head gaskets in place. So then my kind of cheap but clever idea, I'm like, well, what if I just cut the excess trim of the head gaskets off? It won't actually matter. And I devised, started making a sharp tool to do it. That didn't work and I stopped immediately. <laughs> but the process of the Viper at this point kind of became a longer thing. I was gonna take my time and do it right because I decided I'm gonna keep this car forever and I want it to be right, it's a labor of love. But it was also sort of resurrecting the memories, but it was almost became more personal. The car had a personality, it was almost had a soul at this point, and I sort of had to bring this soul back from the dead in a way. And as silly as it seems, the car was sort of dark 
when it came back. It had a personality. The personality before was very bright and vibrant and over the top and exciting when I had it, as I imagine a lot of people will make fun of my personality for being. But when the car came back from being wrecked, it was almost like an old Greek sort of story, like it came back from the river Styx from the dead, and now it has these black wheels and like black tinted headlights and windows and this wing and it rides harsh and it's like it came straight from hell. And it sort of did coming back from that. So in resurrecting it and fixing it, I'm taking apart the engine in my condo. Heads are coming off. I'm pulling the radiator out so I can pull the long V10 camshaft out of the front. I'm thinking, okay, I'll have the heads rebuilt, as you do. So I took it to my engine builder, but the greatest thing when I went to pick it up, he's like, Casey, I'm charging you 40 bucks for cleaning them up. I, I decked them, they're perfectly straight. The valves are fine. I, I, could, I could work on it, but there's really no point. Just get some head gas and put it back on. But it was something that I kept for myself. I didn't do it at the shop and I didn't rush it and do it in a business-like way because I wanted to enjoy it. I wanted to have the personal attachment of bringing it back to life. For a lot of people that have wondered why do I have the license plate Odysseus on the car, um, is because I was thinking of the meanings back when. Because my first license plate on the car was Enzo Who, because I was a cocky punk and I thought it was fun to beat up on <laughs> guys with Ferraris at the time. But in thinking about it again, I saw so many things from the story of the car and my own life and picking myself you know, up and moving that just related to the Odyssey that that ended up sticking and kind of was adding so much more meaning to the tale. But that, that is the story of the Viper going to hell and coming all the way back getting rebuilt and coming back to life forevermore. We'd like to thank Dream Car Exchange for supporting the VinWiki YouTube channel this month. DCX is an enthusiast marketplace with auctions for amazing cars happening now. We've got some awesome things planned with them over the next few weeks that I think you'll enjoy. So please stay tuned, but now browse on over to their site and see if your dream car is the next one across the block.